Please allow me to introduce Miss Tanya Herbert. Uh, she's going to do our lunch and learn today on sizing up firefighter cancer. We hope that uh, you see we adjusted our time to one o'clock to hopefully be more convenient for people. Um, so we welcome any feedback on that. Um, Ms. Tanya Herbert is the owner of Florida PPE Services and Thin Red Line Decon. While working for an architectural firm specializing in the design of public safety facilities, she consulted with researchers and chief officers in the fire service to develop specific design strategies for mitigating exposure to carcinogens and other toxins. Twice yearly, she presented these strategies to fire chiefs across the country at a public safety facility planning seminar. She's used this knowledge to develop on-scene decon supplies, continues to pursue her passion for firefighter health and wellness by consulting with healthy firefighters. What's that, Tanya? <laughs> Scholastia model. Was that what she said? <laughs> to bring the Swedish project's concise decon protocols to U.S. firefighters. She also presented to groups such as National Association of State Fire Marshals, National Volunteer Fire Council, and she opened her floor PPE services in Intertech verified ISP, which cleans, inspects, and repairs firefighter turnout gear. Um, we met at a grant assessment for AFG years ago, and through that, just to give you a, a brief rundown, uh, we, we met through that. So she does have a passion for helping us prevent cancer, um, in conversations, she has uh, developed, um, well, we were, she was working on a, I can, I can talk about a body wash, a charcoal based body wash, because in conversations I spoke about firefighters and we, we work, when we work a good fire and we clean, you know, days, sometimes two days later, you, when you sweat, you still smell the smoke in your hair um, when you sweat. And so she was um, working on this charcoal-based body wash when COVID hit. And if I'm not mistaken, the bottles were then utilized for hand sanitizer. Many of us capitalized on that when hand yeah. sanitizer was hard to, to acquire. And so as that, the demand for hand sanitizer uh, started diminishing, she, she started bottling up the body wash. So we do um, use that here. It's uh, supplied to company officers for our folks to use uh, in their shower within an hour program. And uh, so we've had a lot of positive feedback for that. So without further ado, let me uh, uh, turn it over to Ms. Tanya Herbert and um, for her presentation. Thank you, Chief Boutwell, I appreciate that. Um, so after developing the on-scene decontamination supplies, one of my customers is the Orlando Fire Department, and I was out at a live training burn with them. And one of their chief officers said, hey, do you know of anybody that would open a gear cleaning business here in Central Florida? We're tired of shipping our gear uh, over to the West Coast of Florida. So in 2020, I opened Florida PPE Services. Uh, as Chief Outwell mentioned, we are an independent service provider that is verified by Intertech. And for those of you who don't know, uh, becoming a verified ISP is a challenging project. Um, you have to go through multiple layers of testing. Uh, you, your cleaning and repair procedures are tested and verified. So it's not an easy task to become a verified ISP. However, uh, it's important for the departments to work with a verified ISP so that you can ensure what it, what maintenance they're doing on your gear is proper. But through all of this, I've become very passionate about limiting occupational exposures. And I'm sure that most of you all, oh, I guess we have to put the disclaimer out too. So uh, this will be in the printed version of what you get. Um, with everything that's occurred over the last few years, cancer has become a very well talked about subject in the fire service. What needs to occur also is an understanding that it's not just cancer. There's now a lot of evidence of other occupational illnesses, such as neurological diseases like Parkinson's. There's also infertility issues. There's also issues with um, offspring developing cancer and other illnesses. 
So when we start to, when I talk about cancer, firefighter cancer, that's just the tip of the iceberg. But as most of you know, cancer is a leading cause of death for firefighters now. As approximately 74% of the line of duty deaths from 2022 were from cancer. They're starting to track illnesses. And for any of you all that are not already registered for the National Firefighter Cancer Registry, I invite you to take part in that. Even if you are not diagnosed with cancer, it helps the researchers to track all of the firefighters in the United States so that they can look for trends and uh, specific information that's going to help them develop strategies to mitigate your exposures. This really became an issue um, starting in around 2012 and after uh, a multi-year study by NIOSH looked at 30,000 firefighters in Boston, um, Chicago, San Francisco, and a couple of other, I think Phoenix was in the group, and they showed higher rates of cancer than the general population. When they boiled it all down, basically you have a 9% greater risk of contracting cancer, but a 14% greater risk of dying from cancer than general population. The cancers that you are most likely to contract at a higher rate than the general population, leukemia, colon cancer. A lot of people are familiar with testicular uh, cancer and prostate cancer, but also non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and multiple myeloma have very high rates. A lot of people are trying to understand why this is occurring. What's changed over the last 30 years is the way materials and your built environment is constructed. So many of the legacy finishes of yesteryear are gone. They've been replaced with modern materials that contain synthetics. And when these synthetics burn, they release toxins. The International Association for Research on Cancer has identified 19 group one, which is a known carcinogen, uh, 2A, a probable carcinogen, or 2B, a possible carcinogen in foot. And uh, June of last year, IARC recently uh, reclassified the occupation of firefighting as now a group one known carcinogen. It was previously a TB, which was a, a probable, or sorry, possible, but with all of the research that has come out, they pulled together a working group and reviewed all of the documentation, all the information, research, and reclassified it. It's not just because of the soot, uh, the toxins in the soot. It also has to do with sleep deprivation, um, increased, increased uh, adrenaline, things like that. But understand that your occupation is hazardous to your health. So we need to do everything we can do to help keep you healthy. Really, over the last couple of years, the big buzz has been firefighter cancer and PFAS. So let's start with basic understanding of what PFAS is. The P in PFAS is per or poly, per meaning fully and poly meaning many, fluoroalkyl substances. And it's a group of synthetic compounds. The EPA recognizes nearly 15,000 different PFAS chemical compounds. So when you start to talk about PFAS, you have to understand it is this very large umbrella of, of compounds. Not all of them are significantly detrimental. There are definitely some that are, but the average person is exposed to PFAS through many different ways. And let me say too, it's believed that 97 to 99% of Americans have detectable levels of PFAS in the blood. It comes from drinking contaminated drinking water, eating fish that is uh, from water that's contaminated, Eating food that was packaged in material that contains PFAS. How many of you have gone to Starbucks and bought a coffee, a to-go cup? How many of you eat, have eaten microwave popcorn? All of these have a PFAS coating on the food containers. It keeps the food from sticking to the container. That has PFAS in it. Um, there's so many products, household products that contain PFAS, it would blow your mind. Some of the products that contain PFAS, like I said, uh, fast food containers, grease resistant paper to go, to go uh, containers, nonstick cookware, all of your Teflon cookware, all of it contains PFAS. 
um, stain resistant coatings that used on carpets and upholsteries. Use the other door. Sorry, I'm trying to come to the door. Uh, stain resistant uh, coatings on carpets, upholstery and clothing. Any of you who do any type of hiking or camping, um, all of that is water resistant and all of that contains PFAS. Many cleaning products also contain PFAS, but surprisingly is the number of personal care products and cosmetics that contain PFAS. Dental floss is a prime example. Hopefully all of us are flossing our teeth. Um, and also paints, varnishes, and sealants. So how are firefighters exposed to PFAS? You have several entry routes as well. Uh, again, the PFAS that's in environmental sources that I just mentioned. Of course, everyone's very familiar with PFAS and AFFF. There's also, every time you're fighting a fire, any of the toxins in the environment, the, in the IDLH that are burning, probably contain PFAS as well. And then of course, PFAS in the bunker gear. There has been a lot of discussion around this. I know the IAFF has made this one of their cornerstone um, talking points. And it is certainly an issue, but it's one that you really need to understand. And what I wanna do is really help you understand how your turnout gear operates and how that relates to PFAS in the gear and the exposures that you have. So your turnout gear is basically made up of three components, your outer shell and then your liner. And the liner is composed of two parts, the thermal barrier and the moisture barrier. Basically the functions of the outer shell are to provide that first line of defense against heat and flame and abrasion. So it's a tough, durable fabric. Uh, it protects the moisture barrier and the thermal barrier and it allows the garment to shed water and other hazardous fluids. It's got a tight weave on it. It may have Kevlar or Nomex in it to help uh, maintain the strength of the fibers. The thermal barrier is obviously to provide your thermal in in insulation and it's the part of the garment that's closest to the body. Um, the picture that you see on there shows the thermal liner inside out. Normally the quilt side is what's gonna be against your body. And it's usually made of two parts. You've got a quilted part and then the non-woven bat that's underneath. Now your moisture barrier. The moisture barrier prevents the, the hazardous fluids that you may be exposed to, whether it's steam from the water using during suppression or any other types of hazardous liquids that you come across. Uh, whether it's diesel or um, hydraulic fluids or something like that, but also from bloodborne pathogens. And it's typically also a two-part laminated material, the membrane and the face cloth. The membrane is too fragile to be by itself, so it's adhered to a face cloth. And this is very important in the THL performance of your gear. So you have a TPP and a THL ratings that help determine the functionality of your gear. And the THL is very important. I'm sorry, the moisture barrier is important in the THL performance. So a lot of the concern has been the PFAS and the outer shell finishes. There is a durable water repellent finish on all outer shells. This helps prevent, or this allows the water and oil and anything else to not be absorbed into the outer shell, but to rather to run off. So one thing to remember is all oil repellents also repel water, but not all water repellents repel oil. It's much harder to repel water. So basically what we wanna do is set the standard, I'm sorry, it's harder to repel oil. So we wanna set the, the bar by repelling oil and then water's gonna be repelled from that. There are PFAS, compounds in your moisture barrier. Um, it's basically something called PTFE. And I'm not gonna try and pronounce the full word of it because I know I'll butcher it. But basically this allows pores that will, when I mentioned the THL is an important component of the, of the moisture barrier, the PTFE allows that moisture barrier to be breathable while still keeping the liquids out. You need to be able to sweat 
and the vapor from inside needs to be able to escape. Otherwise, you're going to heat up too much and that's going to obviously limit your ability to function. There has been some concern with, P with PTFE shedding off the moisture barrier. Um, but what you need to understand is PTFE is used in so many things that consumers um, use every day. But the biggest is it's used in implanted medical devices. So if you have any type of stent, um, if you have any type of pacemaker that's been implanted, chances are there is PTFE in it. Because again, it's a, a resistant coating and it's critical for those types of medical devices. There have not been any recognition of significant medical or health issues from these implanted medical devices. So while PTFE may be in your moisture barrier, there's really not been consistent evidence about how that PTFE could contribute to the cancer risk for firefighters. So in recognition of the PFAS and the gear, there are some challenges and limitations to turnout gear. Obviously you have to use turnout gear. Um, when we can limit the amount of time you spend in your turnout gear, great. Um, but recognize, I mean, obviously you recognize that it is providing crucial protection for you. Um, it's providing protection against hazardous substances, but it's not the end all be all. And I know you guys probably saw these images with uh, Todd LaDuke last week, but this is a good refresher course on what your turnout gear and other components ensemble elements do. Um, this is before exposure uh, to firefighting. And then once your hood was on, this was a replicated test and aerosol, fluorescent aerosol test. The picture on the right simulates the soot being deposited on your skin. <laughs> picture on the left is before exposure. Picture on the right is after exposure. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on the interface and the inability for the soot to be completely kept out of your skin. Surprisingly was the amount of soot that was deposited on the legs with the boot and pant interface. Uh, we think this has to do with the pressurization and the soot billowing up under the turnout pants. But again, this is to emphasize the limitations of your gear. You're not in a class A hazard suit. There is gonna be soot that gets deposited on your skin. And it's critical for you to understand that this is a significant route of exposure. There's basically four route, three routes of exposure, inhalation, ingestion, and absorption. And studies have shown that dermal absorption is the greatest route of exposure for carcinogens. One of the other issues that we're seeing with turnout gear and the limitation is the potential discomfort and reduced mobility in high temperature environments. Um, so what ends up happening is a lot of people will not fully don their gear uh, or they'll be quick to doff it when they come out. So they may not wanna use it during overhaul. Um, there's a lot of resistance to keep it on to go through preliminary exposure reduction. But it's really important that you understand that the longer you can keep your gear on, um, the better. One of the other limitations to turnout gear is the degradation that can happen from obviously heat and chemicals, but specifically from UV light. UV actually will damage the moisture barrier. <clears throat> it can potentially lead to a disintegration of the seam tape, but also the outer shell material. So the picture on the right I'm sure so many of you, I, I see it across departments all over the US where you will um, set your turnout pants in your boots and then have them flipped open right by the engine so that when you get a call, you're ready to go. Well, what happens is the sunlight that's streaming into your apparatus bay or the UV lights that are in the apparatus bay, 
the UV light diminishes and disintegrates the material. You can see the kind of tannish coloring on the, uh, the thermal liner picture on the right. That's all UV, all UV damage to that material. Um, I don't know how well you can see the picture on the left corner. That's what it looks like. And you can tell those pants were flipped open. Uh, we see a lot of seam tape degradation. The seam tape prevents the any type of hazardous fluid from seeping through any stitching, but frequently I see seam tape falling off and we believe that it may be partially from UV damage. This is a video that um, when you look at this here, it looks like it's in pretty good shape, but let's watch, watch what happens. What you're seeing is the Nomex and the Kevlar fibers have disintegrated. And that is what gives you the strength and durability in your outer shell. The fabric, the um, threads that are left are just not strong. They're going to disintegrate. So this comes from, you know, a lot of times I'll see jackets hanging on the door of the apparatus, or we also see gear that is stored in lockers in the apparatus bay and full sunlight streaming in. And that's what's going to happen to your gear when you continue to allow it to be exposed to UV light. One of the other hazards with your gear is contamination from your suppression activities and then cross contamination from your gear to other items or from improper cleaning procedures. I can promise you a lot of people think their gear is cleaner than it is. Um, the picture that you see on the left is a soap tank. So anytime we do an annual advanced cleaning for any of our customers, we soak the outer shells in a uh, detergent-based solution for an hour. The picture on the right is what our tank looks like before when the water's freshly put in. The picture that you see on the right was after we soaked gear from a customer who said, oh yeah, we wash our gear, it's clean. It doesn't need to be advanced clean. And I said, please let me go ahead one time and do it and then you can decide. And after she saw that picture, she was horrified. Uh, this was from, I did one piece of gear. This was a little soap tank that we have that um, someone said that they had washed their gear three times at their station. And I said, okay, it still smells like smoke. So let me, let me give it a soak and see what happens. And that's what the before and after looks like. So a lot of manufacturers are working on developing PFAS free materials. And the majority of the outer shell materials that we have in our shop right now for repairs since 2020 are PFAS free materials. There is some concern, however. Um, so rather than using a PFAS coated, let me back up just a little bit. What happens is uh, PFAS will be coated on the fibers and then the fibers are woven together. That coating allows the fibers to have a protection on them, a protection from the carcinogens being absorbed into the fiber, but also the fibers rubbing against each other. It's a barrier. And so the material has a little bit, it, it, your gear is designed to last 10 years and that coating is important to help the material last that long. What's happening is they are developing PFAS free coatings. Uh, some are silicone based, some are wax based. There is some concerns that not only are these materials not holding up as well, so the coating that's on the fibers is disintegrating faster and therefore the material is rubbing against itself and abrading. But there is also some discussion on what happens. And I'm gonna show you something. This came from Dr. Brian Ormond at North Carolina State University. Dr. Ormond has been testing PFAS free materials to see what types of issues we may see rather than with the materials being PFAS free.
that we be hearing him speak? You can't hear him speak? No. Oh, okay. So basically what he's telling you is this is the water, diesel, and hot hydraulic fluid. The unfinished materials, it soaks in pretty well. The PFAS free materials, they're used because they give the highest repellency. Diesel absorbs just a little bit, but the hydraulic fluid you can see just runs right off. So this is the wax base repellency. Um, you can see that it repels water very well, but it does not repel diesel fluid or hydraulic fluid very well. It soaks in quite a bit and they have a concern about that. Um, silicone does basically the same thing, repels the water very well, but the diesel and the hydraulic fluids um, are absorbed a little bit better. So what it means is if they have these chemicals that get absorbed into the gear, these are flammability tests that they do. Um, the one on the left has no chemical exposure. One on the right has splashed with hydraulic fluid. There really is not a big difference in what happens. When they're looking at one of the PFAS free treatments, um, no liquid splashed on the left one, not much happens, but if the material on the right is splashed with hydraulic fluid, this is what happens. So is the question is, is this level of repellency necessary? And if it is, what other alternatives do they have? Um, so this was one other test I did where on the left, it was just splashed and the right, it was soiled and it was pushed into the fibers. So you can see there's still some issues with it. So basically, what the what the questions are and what the concern is oops, sorry what they're trying to determine now is what level of protection is necessary and how can we best achieve that while still limiting the pizza why can i not get this to go to the next sorry i'm having trouble it that way. Um, so basically the question comes down to what are the best alternatives to PFAS? If, is it necessary to come up with another alternative uh, rather than the PFAS materials? Because really it's a trade-off. When you're eliminating the PFAS from your outer shell especially, there are some considerations some significant concerns on what's going to happen, both with the repellency of flammable fluids, but also, as I mentioned, the material is not holding up well. I can tell you the material that we're getting in here to our shop to clean, here that's coming in that's only 18 months old with PFAS free material, looks like it's five or six years old. The material is abrading, it is not holding up well. Um, it's much, much harder to get clean. We have to scrub it. Um, and it's still, especially when, if you have tan or gold gear, um, it's just a lot dirtier. And what's happening is the particulates are embedding into the fibers. So the concern is, are we trading one set of problems for another? So knowing all of this, what strategies can we implement to minimize firefighter cancer and other illnesses? Um, one of the biggest things that we see is uh, NFPA 1851 compliance. And NFPA 1851 is your standard for the selection care and maintenance of your turnout gear. Uh, that's the standards under which the ISPs operate. But that standard was written for you as a fire department on what is your role and responsibility for the maintenance of your gear. 
1851 went through a pretty big revision in 2020, and it's going through another really significant revision right now. It, it's due out in probably 2025. And what they're doing is they're con combining several standards together. They're combining 1851, which is uh, your turnout gear with 1852, which is your SCBA. And that new standard will be NFPA 1850. There are also some other changes that are going on with 1971. Um, that's going to become 1970. And one of the biggest changes coming out of that is mandatory particulate hoods. So if you are not currently an NFPA member, I highly encourage you to register. And then you can follow the different iterations of the new standards and offer public comment on them. So compliance with 1851. And there, I could teach a whole class on how to be compliant with 1851. My daughter hates the saying, but there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. Whether you're doing your own advanced cleanings, whether you're sending them to an ISP to do your advanced cleaning, whether you're sending it just to the ISP for an advanced cleaning and uh, annual inspection, or whether you wanna do your own advanced inspections. There's a lot of ways to take care of it, but it's really important, especially in the states that now have pretty significant cancer presumptive coverage, I think it's going to be incumbent on the departments to show that they are maintaining their gear and therefore helping to prevent occupational illnesses. Both Texas and California have made NFPA 1851 the law. So that standard is now considered law and every year in Texas and California, their records will be inspected to ensure compliance with 1851. Whether other states follow suit um, remains to be seen. I have a feeling that we will see that. But again, the more states that pass presumptive legislation, the more incumbent the departments will be to show that they're doing everything that they can to minimize their cancer exposures. Um, mandatory use of PPE. Well, sorry, I'm making sure I'm staying on top of things. Um, mandatory use of PPE, as I mentioned, using it during overhaul. Um, one of the interesting studies that came out of Tucson and the University of Arizona was looking at mitigation strategies. So first of all, what they did was they tested members of the department. They did a urinary bioanalysis bio where they gave urinary samples um, as they were coming on shift and then after any type of exposure and then as they were coming off shift and then 24 hours later. And interestingly enough, the position that had the highest biomarkers for toxins in their system was the pump operators. And typically that's going to be because they're not on air and they can be exposed to particulates from the IDLH, but they're also exposed to the diesel particulates if the engine's running. So when they had the pump operators go on air and then retest everything, they had a significant reduction in the amount of pHs that were in their system. As part of the study, they also implemented preliminary exposure reduction. This was one of the other big changes to NFPA 1851 and 2020 was the inclusion of preliminary exposure reduction. And it's basically otherwise known as on-scene gross decon. They don't wanna refer it to gross decon because that suggests a hazmat um, environment. So they're calling it preliminary exposure reduction instead. And it's basically doing some type of decon on scene, whether it's wet or dry decon, and then bagging your gear, um, bagging to prevent the cross-contamination. And hopefully if you're doing some type of preliminary exposure reduction, you're doing it on air and you're getting rid of some of the largest particulates that you're exposed to. Again, their uh, bagging part of it includes bagging the gear to prevent cross-contamination. There's a lot of discussion on clean cab and 
whether that's the right way to go. And again, there's a lot of different ways to tackle the problem. A lot of departments aren't gonna have a million dollars to spend on a new apparatus. So bagging your gear, uh, whether you use a garbage bag or there's bags on the market now that um, have a, a, a welded zipper. So it's a gas tight zipper, so it won't off gas. I will tell you, I've had a couple of departments that have accidentally thrown away gear that was in black garbage bags. Um, a department in Georgia, not Chief Boutwell's department, but a department in Georgia had put three sets of gear in plastic garbage bags. They pulled up onto the apparatus, dropped the bags off on the side of the apron, right in a little grassy area, pulled the engine in, went inside, did their shower within the hour, and then came back out and the bags were gone. Um, the very nice yard maintenance crew came through and helped them clean up their garbage. So if you are going to use a garbage bag, please make sure you use a clear one instead of a black one. Uh, Turnout gear is too expensive to throw away accidentally. Uh, shower within the hour. Um, I, I mentioned starting with preliminary exposure reduction. If you're going to do an on-scene decon of your gear, you also should be doing an on-scene decon with your skin. As I mentioned, absorption is the greatest route of exposure. There's been multiple studies now that confirm that. And North Carolina State University, just um, one of their doctoral students just presented his um, defense of his doctorate. And his research was on using whites and they were shown to be effective, um, especially with the heavier particulates um, like uh, BAP, uh, the benzopyrene. They were, there were some mixed results on the lighter molecular weight, but the sooner you can get those um, particulates, the contaminants off your skin, the better. There's a lot of discussion on using saunas. I will tell you there's not any definitive study yet that says that doing, that sweating out the toxins is good for you. I know there are there's one study in particular, but one of the limitations of that study was multiple other factors went into improving the health of the subjects and each method wasn't isolated. So they can't determine how much of it was contributed to sauna use. The concern with saunas is that you are coming from an elevated body temperature being in the ideal age. Your kidneys are responsible for eliminating 96% of your toxins that you're that are in your body. If you go back into an elevated body temperature state by going into a sauna, you're taxing your kidneys and it may reduce their effectiveness at getting rid of the toxins that are in your body. So if you're going to do a sauna, our recommendation is that you come back, you shower off, you cool down, um, you clean up, and then go and do the sauna. I know people swear by sweating out, you know, the crap, you're still smelling it, but um, definitely shower within the hour is going to help. Uh, proper advanced cleaning, inspection, repair, and storage of your turnout gear. Again, um, advanced cleanings are now a requirement for NFPA 1851. An advanced cleaning means that it is a mechanical action from a front loading machine that is programmable using a detergent that has a pH level of 6.5 to 10. Any pH level lower or higher could damage your gear. So if you are using a detergent and doing your own washing, please look at the SDS sheet for the detergent and make sure in its undiluted form that it has a pH range of 6 to 10.5. Mechanical action and machine that's programmable. The reason they say machine is programmable is because most commercial laundry machines are set to spin at 440 Gs. The recommended setting for turnout gear is 100 Gs. This is because the extra centrifugal force of a higher setting can damage your seam tape and cause it to separate from the moisture barrier. So mechanical action, uh, programmable machine, water that's not hotter than 105 degrees and um, using appropriate pH. Um, they also discuss storing your gear. 
And again, I kind of touched on the UV light. Please make sure wherever you're storing your gear does not have UV exposure, whether from sunlight or UV lights. If you have it stored in a room that has UV lights, uh, it's recommended that you put the lights on a motion detection system. Uh, if there's sunlight that streams into the room, it's really easy to put some paper up on the windows and block out the sunlight. Uh, you can also store it in some type of um, bag or other type of storage container that's going to eliminate UV lights. Again, I touched on this mandatory use of PPE at all times, uh, especially during overhaul. It's suggested that the, the environment can be off-gassing for up to 72 hours. So please make sure that you are staying in PPE. Um, they, did have, they have conducted a study on arson investigators, and they actually had some of the highest levels of PAHs in their bloodstream, um, which is not surprising. As Chief Thoughtwell mentioned, I used to work for an architectural firm, and back in 2014, we were asked to design a station to control contaminants from being brought back into the living quarters. And when we started asking why, um, they mentioned that they had had two of their personnel diagnosed with cancer. So the firm I worked for was actually one of the first in the country to start implementing the hot, warm, cold, or red, yellow, green design strategies where you are limiting the contaminants to certain areas that can be cleaned and fully decontaminated. And then having transitional zones where personnel and gear can be cleaned before you're going back into the living quarter or any place else where you might expose the public um, to contaminated gear. Uh, implementing clean air strategies. Again, uh, diesel fumes contain heavy particulates, which are extremely toxic. So whether you're using a prime event, magna grip, um, any type of exhaust system, make sure you use it. I can't tell you how many stations I've visited where they have a prime event system, but it's not connected. So please make sure that you are using your whatever method you have. And then part of that includes having airlocks and positive pressure and negative pressure areas you want your bunker gear stored in an area that has a um, its own ventilation system so that it can off-gas separately and not ventilate back into the living quarters at all. So if you are looking at doing a new station, I highly, highly recommend you find an architectural firm that specializes in the design of fire stations. It is not the typical type of design that your regular architect may understand. Um, one of the strategies that we recommend is have, taking your local architect and having them partner with a national firm that specializes in this, but they'll be able to help you with all these strategies. I'm sure Todd LaDuke um, emphasized this over and over again, and I'm going to do it again, regular checkups and screening. Um, especially if you as a new firefighter coming in and you have a baseline that you can use to then monitor your health throughout your career, it's going to significantly help your medical providers be able to detect early any type of abnormality or anomaly. And obviously the sooner they can catch something, um, the much higher the survival rate. I can't emphasize this enough on training and on the proper use and maintenance of turnout gear. So I actually conduct NFPA 1851 classes and over and over and over again, I have people tell me, I've been a firefighter for 10, 15 years. I had no idea. Um, some of the things that we talk about are separating your liners from your outer shells when you are washing them. Um, the two biggest reasons are all of the contaminants that are on your outer shell. If you wash them with your liner, they're cross-contaminating the liner, which sits up against your skin. The other reason is the hardware on the outer shell can damage your moisture barrier and your liner, your thermal liner. But most people have never been taught to separate, and they'll throw the components all in together into the extractor. So understanding why you need to do this and how it can help 
is critical. Again, a lot of people don't understand the detriment that UV sunlight causes to their gear. And then when they start having gear that disintegrates, they want to blame it on the manufacturer when in fact it had more to do with how the gear was being stored. And again, going back to the same thing as medical screenings, um, maintaining proper diet and sleep re regimen. I know that's extremely difficult. Uh, sleep deprivation is one of the biggest issues in the fire service. A lot of departments are looking at doing 4896 uh, shift schedules now. There has been some research that suggests this allows for a greater recovery time with sleep. Um, I do know a couple of departments that have implemented it and it's worked very well for them. Um, some departments that may not be possible, but trying to maintain proper diet and sleep as best you can is certainly going to help you in the long run. So what are we looking at for current and future solutions on improving your gear? Um, one of the biggest things that we've seen is obviously the development of the particulate hoods. Um, and using that type of material for other components in the gear or in undergarments. There's actually several companies out there now that have particulate underwear and particulate t-shirts. Um, obviously the groin area and the underarms are some of the most permeable skin. And so being able to prevent any um, type of absorption in those areas is obviously a good thing. Um, they're also looking at more breathable, lightweight, durable materials. Um, the manufacturers have been designing the gear to minimize the, the billowing of the soot. Um, I know Globe, Lion, Lion has their red zone gear, Globe's got their uh, gear where it has, um, the interfaces are a lot tighter and it's, preventing anything from billowing up into the, the gear. However, it has been a trade-off. Um, a lot of people are complaining now that the gear is not breathable. They're getting too hot. They can't sweat and then cool down. So they're constantly innovating, trying to develop better materials. And again, we've talked about PFAS free materials and what the options are. I think you'll still see some further development in that because we're just not there yet on what can help shed any type of hazardous fluids, but also be um, free from PFAS materials. Again, please encourage training, education. Um, so many people that I talk to, especially older firefighters say, well, too late for me. If I'm gonna get cancer, I'm gonna get it. I really discourage that kind of talk for two reasons. Number one, it's not too late. And number two, you are setting a precedence for any of the firefighters that are under you. And I've worked with some departments on trying to change habits in the fire service. And we've really seen that it's not only a bottom up, but a top down approach. The younger generation of firefighters really want to stay healthy. They wanna have a long retirement, but obviously they're following the cues of their company officer. And so it really requires having everyone on board about understanding what the risks are, what you can do to minimize that, those risks, and then um, making sure that people actually follow through with those actions. So doing a preliminary exposure reduction, wiping off on scene, not ingesting any food or water until you've cleaned up, um, proper doffing procedures for taking your gear off. There was a great study out of IFSI on the procedures for doffing your gloves and your hood and how much that could um, reduce the amount of carcinogens that are deposited on your skin. Uh, again, early and often medical screenings and then um, continued collaboration between researchers and manufacturers and firefighters. I touched on the National Registry I can't emphasize that enough. It, that information is critical for researchers to be able to see trends and to make connections that will help develop better materials, procedures, et cetera. Um, it is anonymous. It's not going to have any implication on your career, 
But if for some reason you don't choose to do that, there's another option. There's something called um, Enforce. It's uh, an exposure tracking system that ties into your Enforce system that you can do as an app on your phone. You record any type of exposure that you had, any type of preliminary exposure reduction that you did, and then you have that information. So if you are ever diagnosed with cancer, then you can take that and help establish your case for your coverage for your department. So basically, in conclusion, um, there is significant risk of occupational illnesses, not just cancer. Um, your turnout gear can help prevent those exposures, but improper use and maintenance of it can help contribute to it. And whether that's through PFAS in the gear, PFAS in the environment when you are in an IDLH, or PFAS and the AFFF, which has pretty much been eliminated by now, but it's still out there in some situations. Um, but what it comes down to is basically you have the ability to make a difference in your own career, but also in anybody else that you are working with. So please, please, please make a preliminary exposure reduction and proper maintenance a habit. Okay, that's all I got. Any questions, Chief Outwell? So we have to uh, feel free to unmute and ask any questions you have for Tanya or uh, I've been monitoring chat. I don't have anything in there as of right now, but I would like to um, recognize the USA branch president of IFE, Randall Hannafin, and give him the opportunity to say a few words. Um, I did not do that in the beginning and I should have, but we are um, logged in under something differently. So um apologize for that. I'd like to give the president a moment if you'd like to say a few things. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you not doing it at one o'clock because I would have not been present. I got pulled into a, a budget meeting, so got to get some money for the fire department. Um, thanks, Tanya, for being here. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. We uh, saw your presentation at our annual education conference, and we thought this was something that definitely needed to be seen by more people. So, uh, we've come back to do the lunch and learn, so we greatly appreciate you being here. Very uh, important topic. Um, you know, as we look towards the future, um, you know, I've personally talked to you and made my prediction that yeah. by the time I retire or get out, that there'll be like Tyvek suits. We'll just get them out, use them once, and throw them in the garbage. Uh, but until then, uh, we need to learn how to do this correctly and uh, make sure we're we're keeping compliant to keep our personnel safe. So I greatly appreciate. It. I greatly appreciate everybody that's been on the lunch and learn and uh, these are becoming quite popular and uh, I wouldn't be remiss without thanking uh, Chief Boutwell and uh, Becky Prince for uh, helping to put these together and make them happen. So I uh, greatly appreciate it. Everybody have a great day. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, if you had trouble with the link earlier, it was a Zoom link. I have corrected that. So if you use the, it's a Google Docs link, leave your name and email, then we will email out a certificate for one hour CPD credit. Hey, Chief, this is Randy. Chief Botwell? Yes. Hey, this is Randy. I got a question. How do you, I noticed you were uh, recording this or taping it. How can well, I get a copy of that? And if, if I can get a copy of it, I'll make sure to try to disseminate it throughout some of my contacts. I, I think this is great information. It's something that should have been done a long time ago, and uh, people have dropped the ball on it. So I want to see uh, see if I can get a copy of that and do my part to educate people. Uh, thank you for that. Um, what the process is, I get with Pecky um, within a day or two after uh, this session, and we do upload it to YouTube, and um, I, will, I can try to also get a link for you to send it out. But really, I got a lot of credit that really belongs to her on that part. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chief. Well, Ms. Herbert, uh, this is Byron Kennedy. I, I do have a quick question. I actually, uh, hopefully you didn't talk about it, uh, but I apologize if you did. I, I have two contractors here, so I had to walk away and talk to both of them for a second. Uh, my question really is, are there any advancements in the helmets uh, as far as decon? I won't say deconning helmets, but uh, cleaning helmets now, because most agencies now have two sets of gear, uh, but most agencies only have one one helmet 
And um, I know, yeah, we can wipe them off on the outside, try to decon them the best we can on the outside of the helmets. But I'm really more specifically talking about the inner shell. Uh, how any advancements on that? Um, there are some pieces of equipment out now that uh, basically the SCBA washers can be, uh, I won't say retrofitted, but there's components that where you can use the SCBA washers to decon the helmets. Uh, we are recommending that the shrouds and the liner interface be removed and washed. Uh, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> our staff, we're working with Volusia County here in Florida, and we went out to each of the stations on Monday to start doing their helmet cleaning. That's the biggest problem is they can't send the helmets to us for a full decon, so we're having to go out there and do it. So the biggest part is making sure the inner components are taken out. And if nothing else, you can put them in a bucket. Of, we just use citrus squeeze. We'll take, that's the detergent we use here in our ISP. We'll take that in a bucket and we'll wash the components. Um, and then cleaning it out. SC14 is the hard surface cleaner that we use and citrus squeeze is the detergent. But yes, it is critical. Um, if the department can do a, an SCBA washer, they can be used for boots, gloves, helmets, um, in addition to the SCBAs. They're expensive, but they're a good piece of equipment to have. Agreed. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, if we don't have any more questions for Tanya, I would like to remind everybody that next month we'll have uh, Chief Chris Bloom with Upstream Thinking and his presentation. So stay tuned for that announcement. Well, Chief Atwell, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate the chance to speak with everyone. As you know, this is a passion for me. So I appreciate letting me present the information. Thank you. It's, it's our pleasure to have you. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks, Packy. We all good? Yes, ma'am. <laughs>